Hey everyone, Gravity here. Before the video begins, I simply ask that if you enjoy my content to hit that subscribe button below. Nowhere else on YouTube are you going to find a Battlefield player who's played with teams competitively since Battlefield 1942, nearly 18 years ago. Don't forget to subscribe, and please enjoy the video. From Battlefield 1942 on, the competitive community thrived in the Battlefield series. Although by Battlefield 4, it was exhausted, shrinking, and largely relegated to very small 8v8 leagues and 5v5 rush. Private servers, in conjunction with competitive websites like Cal, TeamWarfare.com, and ESL, along with dedicated members of the competitive community, hosted, administered, and grew the competitive Battlefield scene through sheer enjoyment of the game. There was almost never a prize and it was just to see who the best was. Perhaps without private servers, one of the first ever televised esports competitions in North America, the Championship Gaming Series, would never have included Battlefield 2. Competition gives a game staying power. Competitive players always look forward to the next season, the next match, the next scrim. They help keep a game populated and popular, and now with the popularity of esports, there is great potential to have such a great community thrive again. A few months ago, I released a video entitled A Dream of Battlefield. It presented a theoretical future Battlefield game, how it would work and what would be included. In it, I also argued that Battlefield 5 did not have the enthusiasm, support, player count, sales, and just far too many problems to actively support it for much longer. Here we are, six months later, and that is exactly what has happened following the game's final content update this June. There is one feature, however, that matters to me the most, and I spent a lot of time during the later sections of the video talking about it because of how important it is. Competitive Battlefield. I referenced the now-transpired expiration date of Battlefield 5 to drive home this lack of legacy of yet another Battlefield game, one which had immense competitive potential. I am a competitive Battlefield player. I have played in leagues, ladders, and tournaments since Battlefield 1942. I played Battlefield Vietnam competitively, Battlefield 2, 2142, Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4, and then it all went downhill. Not because I chose to stop playing competitively, but because DICE abandoned its competitive player base. They removed the tools, the private servers, the custom settings, the map options, everything that made competitive Battlefield possible. This occurred first with Battlefield 1, and then was taken a step further in Battlefield 5. Even in the community games servers, players were still unable to switch teams, showing just how little effort was put into it. Let's talk about the old days of competitive Battlefield for a few minutes. I sometimes wonder, no, I often wonder, just how it is that the Battlefield community forgot that there actually was once a golden age of competitive Battlefield. At its peak in Battlefield 2, there were hundreds of teams around the world, competing in different regional leagues and occasionally together in larger tournaments. Some of the teams that were competing at the highest level were actually getting sponsored by tech companies to promote their brands just as professional esports players do today. The team I played Battlefield 2 and 3 for was one of those teams, being sponsored at the time by such brands as Cytec, Zboard, Cybersniper, and IcyDoc. Most of the time, we were just given swag, while some teams had the rare opportunity to have a trip to a LAN event covered or partially funded. This is something incomprehensible today for many Battlefield players, casual or otherwise, as there has been no competitive community to rally around, to cheer for, to support, to join. But this did exist. Just taking them down, but uh, artillery getting ready to drop here on mid flag, and I don't think that Origin knows about it, so we're gonna see what happens there. See how many kills this artillery picks up. Two right off the bat, three. Viking, Pfeiffer, and Portobello. Here's the fourth. And now look at this. They got their infantry making a perfect pushback on this flag. They might, they might be able to get this up real quick. While competition first found its footing and ran strong in Battlefield 1942 and Battlefield Vietnam with 5 vs. 5 infantry, 8v8, and 12v12 leagues, 
it was Battlefield 2 that made things incredibly easy for the leagues to thrive. When Battlefield 2 was released, every single map, including DLC maps, were released with a 64 player, 32 player, and 16 player size map variants. The 16 player size maps were damn near perfect for 8v8 and 12v12 competition, with their limited number of flags and reduced vehicles. Teams could plan for matches well ahead of time, create intricate strategies, and try to play to their opponent's weaknesses. Just how popular and strong was the Battlefield 2 competitive scene? There are two major examples that I can share aside from the team sponsorship that was going on. The first was the Battlefield 2 World Tournament, which was overseen and funded by DICE. This tournament was to date the largest Battlefield tournament ever held. It was one tournament for prize money held online and included teams across the world. As one might expect, Yes, pings were sometimes awful to the servers being played on, but in the end, we didn't care. We loved that it even happened. The second example is the inclusion of Battlefield 2 into the first ever televised esports show in North America, the Championship Gaming Series, or CGS, in 2006. Videos from this event are... Mm, difficult to find. But here's the deal. Code 7, the European team that won the Battlefield 2 World Tournament, went up against three of the best North American teams in a bracket. The other teams were Warchild, Team Hot, and 20ID, who ended up winning the event and the $40,000 prize. Again, this was 2006, this was Battlefield, and this actually happened be doing everything they can to push 20 ID back into their home base and to try to deplete their tickets as quickly as possible. Warchild now setting up with that anti-tank infantry. You can see their one APC going down. 20 ID looks to be in a crunch as they are definitely being pushed back. Another TV guided missile goes down and that Warchild helicopter is doing everything it can to stop those vehicles from 20 ID from making a huge difference on this map. Yes, the CGS couldn't show a Battlefield 2 match in full. They edited it down tremendously and it definitely wasn't an easy watch for the outside gamer. The casters also had limited Battlefield knowledge. Still, looking back it was pretty awesome having an esports legend like DJ Wheat cast the Battlefield game, and it was definitely a massive high note for the series. Then, there was the Demo Recorder. Don't know about this little gem? Don't feel bad. DICE has done their best to not remind players of the wonderful toys that no longer exist. The Demo Recorder was exactly what it sounds like. As long as the server had the option to record demos activated, the entire round for which you played was recorded by the server and stored for future access. Players could go to the Demos tab in the main menu, download the demo, and watch that entire round again via spectator mode. You could focus in on one player, or use the free range camera. You could also fast forward the round, restart it, or even slow it down in the event that you were trying to record a cinematic moment. As far as competitive play goes, this was yet another tool which strengthened the community by allowing each player to have an account of the games, as well as for admins to watch in case a player was suspected of cheating. Where did this tool go? Well, when it wasn't included in Battlefield 3, a community manager responded with, and this is true, the tech isn't there, which as you might have guessed, went over just as well with the community as Battlefield 5's recent episode. In the demo recorder's case, it stirred up less of a storm as it wasn't exactly a major game feature. The sad part is, when one takes a look at most AAA FPS games available today, those games come out of the box with the tools necessary for competitive play, or at least make the effort. Battlefield and Call of Duty were once the epitome of the FPS genre, a titan taking on a titan when they were released in the same year. Now, one of these games has incredibly limited game options, and the other, with every release, has ever-growing support, game modes, utilities, and most glaringly obvious, a very involved and thriving competitive community. Guess which one is which. For a AAA game studio not to have some form of competitive option, a game mode, tools, 
literally anything is utterly embarrassing, especially given the environment that once existed. Call of Duty now has had massive esports tournaments in leagues for years. Pro players, sponsorships, the works. Battlefield? has this community games thing that doesn't work well and came out a year into its life, I guess. In case you were curious about the history lesson still, Battlefield 3 saw the competitive community begin to fracture and dissipate. Upon its release, nearly all of the competitive Battlefield 2 II and 2142 teams made the jump over and attempted to continue the competitive Battlefield experience in a new era. But the game was missing something, and it wasn't even the mod support, which was also gone. Battlefield 3 did not feature small, 16-player sized versions of the maps. It just had Conquest and Conquest Large. So, the community had to make do with the Conquest size. This resulted in some challenges. Many Battlefield 3 maps, even on the Conquest size, were still far too big to play on for the 8v8 games the community was used to. Bases were too far away from the flags. On some maps, this led to teams using jets to taxi squads, which led to squad bombing, which sometimes led to jet ramming, which led to jets being altogether banned from use on the map during the match. Some maps also had too many tanks or too many jets, so rules had to be enforced about the amount of vehicles which could be active. Teams had to honor these rules, but occasionally you still had the team of players which made excuses or didn't care. Eventually, the consistent minutiae of never-ending problems with the map size burnt some players out. Others found a competitive home in a different game mode. 4 vs 4 Squad Rush This game mode, of course, was infantry focused, so superfluous players on teams, the weaker infantry players, and vehicle mains either retired from comp or simply went to pub the game, or stopped playing altogether. Battlefield 4, on the other hand, saw a resurgence of competitive Battlefield, possessing a community second only to that of Battlefield 2. The conquest maps were a better size, private servers were still a thing, and admin tools were very much capable of altering necessary game options. In fact, Battlefield 4 had such a strong competitive scene for a few years that major esports teams participated, and live ESL streams broadcasted matches. These are frags you need to pick up at this stage. Yeah, but I mean, Legionnaires though, I mean, they're, they're able to hold on to the Alpha and Bravo for this long. Unfortunately, it does look like Solemn Dig and end up getting picked up from the behind. They're not going to be able to rotate onto that C site just yet, but they have, uh, like I said, they have that A flag. They're going to be able to respawn, push back into that Bravo site. If they can get a couple more, you know, good frags like they were before, then they will be able to come back. Look at the, the, uh, the tickets though right now. 8v8 became the norm again, with the addition of 5 vs 5 infantry and 12 vs 12 in many other leagues. Even level BF continued to host its 32 vs 32 player seasons. The community did a substantial job organizing teams and leagues over the years, but the sheer amount of competitive players and enthusiasm just couldn't be maintained. Many Battlefield 4 leagues were one-offs, and on websites with little outside traffic. Other FPS games were released, and the community withered. Even with the downward trend, it didn't completely eliminate efforts of the competitive community to host Revive leagues over the recent years. Nowadays, even with attempts still being made to host scrims and matches, there just isn't enough of a player base or exposure to reliably make it work. Nevertheless, competitive Battlefield 4 put up a great fight. So now with Battlefield 5 on its last leg, and DICE throwing everything at the development of Battlefield 6, it is time to get this message across. Developers at DICE, I address you directly. It is not too late. I have said this exact phrase in another one of my videos. Competitive players always look forward to the next season, the next match, the next scrim. They help keep a game populated and popular. There is great potential to have such a great community thrive again. If you don't think this matters, consider this. Battlefield 2 was released in June of 2005, and 15 years later, long after support had ended, long after the GameSpy multiplayer backbone was shut down, it is still being played competitively. 
That is a staggering fact. The game is by no means perfect. It wasn't then, and it isn't now. But the features that were there, included at launch, gave the title significant staying power. It has life long after its own death. As someone who has seen the competitive community across nearly all Battlefield games, let me give you a five-step process on how to bring back competitive Battlefield. Step one, you must, must, must have private or fully rentable servers on launch. These would have to be paid for like in past Battlefield games by the communities themselves, but this has never been an issue. These servers are the fully customizable servers that run 24-7. You could, however, continue to use the rental server program or community games in addition to the prime servers. These community servers, which could be used for free temporarily, would have the same customization tools as the prime servers and could be used primarily for competitive teams who don't have the funds to maintain a private server. Step 2 you must provide a detailed, thorough, and easy-to-use set of server tools or a utility in order for competitive teams to easily and conveniently set up their servers for the games. A robust server utility with a significant number of options and settings should be a requirement both for the standard private servers or the rental server program. And once again, these must be available on launch. In a few minutes, I will have a short list of options and ideas that should be part of a server tools. Ideas which also completely remove any necessity or complaints about releasing map editing tools or mod tools. Step 3. You must release a smaller size map for every map you release over the game's lifespan. These should be made specifically for 16 players and have roughly 3 to 4 flags. Just redraw the borders and reduce the vehicle counts. Please take a look at Battlefield 2's map variations for inspiration or reference. Step 4. In lieu of getting something so specific like the old Battlefield 2 Battle Recorder, which I would love, it is time DICE does a massive overhaul of Battlefield's first person kill camera, specifically for the spectator mode. Every incarnation of this feature has been slightly behind the action, whether it's the poor communication with the server, the tick rate of the spectator, or something else. This feature is a requirement for two reasons. First, for competitive play, it gives the spectators, which can be casters broadcasting the game live on Twitch, a front row seat to show how accurate a player is. Currently, all this shows for the spectator is the player missing everything, but still getting the kills. Second, for both competitive and public play, an accurate spectator mode allows for easy and simple verification of cheaters. Step 5. Be involved, but don't be too involved. The competitive battlefield scene sprung up on its own. The community itself made it happen with the tools that we were given. I cannot emphasize this enough. Give the community these tools, and we can make competitive Battlefield a thing again. Be supportive, promote the players, and teams, and events, and more events, and online leagues, and the streams which broadcast those leagues. Put up some money supporting the leagues. But do not favor one system over another. Support your PC leagues, Xbox leagues, PlayStation leagues, and have a community manager specifically for Battlefield Esports. But do not develop your game to have some strange, competitive-specific mode that has never been tried or tested, and that DICE alone has a death grip on. It will fail. Let the community build it up with your support and your promotion. You can do this, DICE. Now, when we talk about server options which should be required for Battlefield 6, we must do so under the assumption a few things are already going to exist. First, private servers on launch. Second, robust server tools with options to change just about everything in the game. Within those tools, a definitive standard 
server customization option for ranked play. Ranked play would be for standard servers with public players and custom map rotations. Changing any unauthorized setting in the utility will force the server to go unranked. This includes many of the options listed shortly. There is no reason whatsoever that an admin or community should not be able to get as creative with their server options as they want, so long as that gameplay is unranked. How unranked? Make it not even affect your stats at all. Or, create two separate tabs of stats, one for ranked and another for unranked. Even in unranked servers, anti-cheat of course should still apply, and cheaters should still be banned. Just because stats are disabled, or something as crazy as low gravity is enabled, doesn't mean hackers get to harass other players. Third, re-establishment of Battlefield 4 Archon and Procon tools in order to customize server options and add various plugins, and be able to do so through in-game server commands and separate web-based tools. In essence, build upon the foundation already laid out in Battlefield 4 tools. Don't take away any of the functionality, just add to it. With that in mind, these are just a few options that should be included as server settings in Battlefield 6. Many of them are straightforward, commonplace things like team switching and silencing players. But at this point in time we have to remember just how poor or non-existent server tools are in the last two Battlefield games. One of the major considerations that DICE has had to struggle with over the years is the lack of mod support or map editing tools. They have had to make the same defense every game as to why they don't include them. To solve this, or at least give them another option, there is one idea that might be the best solution for them. In the server utility, admins should possess the ability to add or remove vehicles from a map in certain locations, and the ability to add or remove a limited number of flags on the map. This is a new concept which would eliminate the need to provide any large-scale modding tools or map editor. Want multiple tanks on a map that doesn't have them? Add them in. Make a map an air superiority map by dropping in 15 planes per team and adding a sky flag. This can be achieved by adding a section to the server tool to show a large version of the game maps. Show the icons of presently available vehicles on the map as well as potentially addable vehicles next to this map alongside the border. Use a drag and drop system to automatically add or remove vehicles as desired. This would be great for competitive play, as well as making insane game modes for public play. This is such a tiny, limited list of potential settings. Ultimately, the scope of the server tools need to be able to grow as requirements or requests dictate. And, above all else, listen to the people who currently run Battlefield 3 and 4 servers and what they need. The Battlefield competitive community once thrived, and it can do so again. Remnants of this competitive community exist, and they still play. With this in mind, and with full knowledge that the Battlefield community has forgotten what competitive Battlefield really looks like, I recently partnered with the Lost Soldiers Battlefield 2 community to showcase how 8 vs 8 matches were played back in the old days. It was great to get back into a game I hadn't played competitively in over a decade. In fact, this partnership has led me to pick up Battlefield 2 once again and participate in the Battlefield 2 Conquest League, as well as being the league's primary English caster. I highly suggest you check out the Battlefield 2 casts on my channel as well as the 8 vs 8 scrim with the Lost Soldiers that renewed my faith in competitive Battlefield. If you are interested in checking out Battlefield 2, I highly recommend visiting the Lost Soldiers website shown here, or click the link below in this video's description. Thank you, take care, and as always, see you on the battlefield.